Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Pat Edwards. Um, hello. Uh, welcome to the planning meeting. Um, live streaming has started. Um, and when we take a break um, today, uh, the live streaming can't be turned off. It's at the moment running in that particular way. Um, but I'll remind people at that point um, so that we don't have conversations that go live that we don't intend to have. Um, so if I can um, uh, start the meeting. <clears throat> There's no fire alarm planned for this evening. Should the alarm sound, please leave via the nearest available emergency exit. Two of the closest exits are through the glass door behind you to my left and through the double doors to the riverside behind. Um, please muster at Café des Amis. Members of the public are welcome to make their own recordings of the meeting using whatever non-disruptive methods they think are suitable. This meeting is being minuted and recorded and will be audio streamed via the Council's website. The Westgate Garden gates on the riverside are locked, so members of the public must leave the Guildhall by the side exit behind the glass door. Um, Lauren, do we have any apologies? We do, Chair. We have apologies from Councillor Dan Smith. Thank you. And any substitutes? We have Councillor Lee Castle here for Councillor Smith. Um, thank you. Um, are there any declarations of interest by councillors or officers? Do we have any? We've, we've received no declarations in advance, Chair. Yeah. All or some councillors may have received correspondence from or spoken with applicants, agents, supporters or objectors, and some of the public speakers may also be known to members of the committee due to their work as councillors. Neither circumstance prevents councillors from participating in the meeting. However, any councillor who considers that they do not have an open mind in respect of any item on the agenda should not participate in the meeting when the relevant item is to be discussed. Thank you. Does anybody else want to make any other declarations of interest? Councillor Bothwell. Uh, yes, just to say that I know, I think someone who's going to speak, um, Terry Thompson, I think he's speaking later. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stockley. Following on, thank you, Chair. Following on from your uh, announcement of live recording, I notice we have acquired a video camera, um, which is currently pointing at you. <laughs> Could you explain a little bit about that, if you wouldn't mind? Uh, apparently, the cameras are not active. Well, they seem to be swiveling quite happily, so I'm just wondering exactly what's going on. They are linked to the system, but it's not being streamed visually, only audio. Thank you. Well spotted. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Councillor Carrells. Just following on from Keith, so I suppose all the Labour councillors know members of the public who are going to be speaking tonight, some members. Thank you. Any other comments about declarations of interest? Okay. Um, public participation, I'll confirm that there are, I think it's now 10 speakers um, this evening, and they will be heard immediately after the officer's pre presentation for any relevant item. Oh. <laughs> I think it's still 11, sorry. Um, I thought somebody had um, pulled out. Um, so, could we go to the minutes of the meeting on the 17th of October 2023, pages 6 to 11 of the pack? Um, if we could confirm it as a true record by general assent, I'd be grateful. Could I have an indication? Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, so, then we move on to um, the application number CA230379, land south of Thanet Way which is pages 12 to 54 in, in your pack. Um, I'm just going to note for the record that Councillor Peter Old will leave the chamber for this item and take no part in the debate or vote as it has been agreed that he is predetermined in this case. Thank you. So now could I ask the um, Deputy Planning Manager, Andrew Gambrell, to introduce the report, please. Andrew, thank you. Just waiting on it to come on screen and then I'll get going. 
But thank you, Chair. And good evening, members. Thank you. Uh, so this is an outline application with all matters reserved at land south of Thunet Way and Whitstable. The proposal is for up to 220 dwellings, a retail community facility and space for a park and bus service, together with associated infrastructure to facilitate the development of the site. Before I get going, uh, a late response was received um, to the application, uh, an objection, um, raising similar matters to those kind of previously raised, but um, they related to the impact on undeveloped land, the impact on infrastructure, and the traffic impacts on the roundabout into the site and roundabout safety in general from uh, a Mr. Wildy. So I'll get going with my presentation uh, following that. So this is the site, kind of broadly outlined in red. Um, the Whitstable Heights development is immediately to the north of the site, just to the north of the Thanet Way. You've got, it's difficult to see, but the little white box is Tesco to the kind of the northeast east. You've got Rake Hill kind of towards the west of the site um, and then kind of countryside really to the south of it. So here you can see the concept master plan for the site. So this is essentially the parameters of how the development would be arranged. So in the yellow and the orange, you've got where the residential development would be. In the purple, in that top part near the roundabout, you've got uh, the retail slash community facility with associated parking area. And this gray area here, you've got the indicative location of the uh, park and bus area reserved for park and bus, which could be delivered in future. And in the green kind of around the site, you've got kind of the open space. And it's also noted, well, it's worth noting that that corner in this left here is a local wildlife site, which is to be protected as part of the proposal. So this illustrative master plan kind of really shows how um, the proposals could be laid out kind of within those parameters that I just um, just explained a minute ago. So this red line is the prowl that runs through the site and then connects up to the Whitstable Heights development. Um, and there's going to be a toucan crossing kind of proposed in this location um, where the prowl crosses the, the Thunet Way. Uh, you can see again the open space arrangement and where the kind of woodland planting is proposed to the south and to the south of the local wildlife site um, together with kind of the, the roundabout fourth arm as well that would be coming into the site and serving the development here you can see that roundabout a bit more closely um, so what you've got you've got a three meter pathway kind of on this south side where the cursor is You've got island crossings, um, which facilitate kind of cyclists getting across and waiting and then over to the north of the Thunet Way. And this plan on the right as well just shows that kind of indicative allotment um, access. This is where the allotments would be, um, which is left in, left out. But further detail is to come forward as part of any future reserve matters application on that particular part of the proposal. Here in red, um, I've just broadly outlined kind of where the three metre um, widening and resurfacing of the Thanet Way footpath cycle way is to the north of the Thanet Way. And in green, again, just reiterating that, that two can crossing location, um, just to give you the context. Here, what I've attempted to do is show kind of essentially the routes to different areas kind of nearby. So the yellow here is the Tesco, so kind of future users that either cross kind of using those crossings at the roundabout I just showed or across the Toucan crossing, go along the Thunet Way to another signalised crossing um, just beyond Golden Hill. And then there's a walkway into the Tesco site through there, which is approximately around a, a 10 minute walk kind of from that part of the site. You've got the pink route, which I've just shown to emphasise kind of how pedestrians and cyclists could access the um, services at the Rake Hill Business Estate, which includes kind of various shops and also the Estuary View Medical Centre. Um, and that's kind of around probably between an 18 to 22 minute walk um, as far as the, uh, the Estuary View is. You've got the blue here, which I kind of touched on it just a moment ago about the prow. So that's been resurfaced at the Whist adjacent to the Whistable Heights site. That would then lead you into Saddleton Road 
and then take you up to Canterbury Road, which could take you into the town. And then a slightly further route, um, but you could cross through into Golden Hill and then up Mill Street Road, Borstal, no, Belmont Road, sorry, and then up to um, kind of Oxford Street entrance, really, in Whitstable. So that's just to give kind of a broad um, kind of insight, really, into how pedestrians and cyclists might access the town via other means other than the car, and also how they would access the Tesco site to the east. What I'm going to do is just show you a few pictures um, of the site. So this green arrow just denotes the angle from which I've taken the picture. So you can see kind of the Thanet Way infrastructure in the foreground, kind of the vegetated perimeter of the site there. This is showing it from the different viewpoint, so kind of towards um, the Duncan Down local wildlife site here. So again, it's kind of showing that vegetated perimeter to the site. Um, this next one probably shows the site most clearly because it rises kind of from the edge of the Thanet Way up to about 20 metres in from the south of the site. And you can see that kind of vaguely on this um, photo from the access, where the access into the site would be, where it increases and inclines before dropping off at the end of the site. And this is just further back, really, um, from within the existing Whitstable Heights development um, that is being constructed at the moment. So those photos really just to give kind of those um, the impression from that kind of that viewpoint really into the site. So kind of moving on really and into the kind of the overall assessment. Um, as members are aware, um, the local planning authority is currently in presumption kind of having not delivered um, a five-year supply of housing and having failed the HDT test, housing delivery test. Um, the benefits and the harm arising from the proposal are set out within the officer's report. Uh, whilst the harm, such as the visual impact of the development and loss of agricultural land weigh against the proposals, the benefits arising from the proposal, such as the provision of 220 dwellings, of which 30% would be affordable, um, the transfer of land for, to enable the delivery of a future park and bus, improvements to surrounding footpath and cycle networks, biodiversity enhancements and open space within the site are considered to outweigh the harm. And as such, it is recommended that the application be approved subject to legal agreement and conditions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> So we now um, move on to listen to our public speakers. Um, has there been a change to the order, um, Lauren? We, we do it as this. Okay, thank you. Um, please could I invite uh, Peter Slaughter to be the first speaker, thank you. Um, you come here and um, we'll help you. Use the microphone there, yeah. Chair, councillors, the committee report indicates that the application must be determined according to the NPPF. So I want to show some of the ways in which the proposals fail to meet the NPPF requirements. NPPF paragraph 130 states that planning decisions should, be, should ensure that developments are sympathetic to local character, including landscape setting, and should maintain a strong sense of place. Para 174 states that planning decisions should contribute to and to an, an, and enhance the natural and local environment by recognising the intrinsic character and beauty of the countryside. Para 185 states that planning decisions should ensure that new development is appropriate for its location. The applicant's proposals fail to meet these requirements. The site is a prominent ridgetop location featuring a picturesque line of trees silhouetted against the sky. The unique skyline gives a strong sense of place and is certainly familiar to anyone travelling along the Thanet Way. The site is publicly accessible and is the best surviving piece of open rural downland with wide pan panoramic views within easy walking distance of Whitstable. Here you are well above the busy roads of Whitstable. You can see the sea and the Essex coast. Turn around and see inland to the Bleen Woods. It is easily as attractive as some of the parts of the Kent Downs area of outstanding natural beauty 
and needs statutory protection, not trashing with more suburban development. The site can be seen from well over a mile away, adjacent the Bleen area of high landscape value. From there, you can look across the site and see the sea in the distance. The applicants may promise to plant trees to screen their development, but you would never be able to ensure they survive long term. Recent experience from Duncan Down is that only 1% of trees planted by developers survive their first year. These issues should demonstrate the proposals would significantly outweigh any benefit from providing 220 houses in this field. They could be provided somewhere more suitable. MPPF paragraph 112 states that applications for development should give priority first to pedestrians and cyclists, both within the scheme and in neighbouring areas. The applicant scheme fails this test. It will increase traffic capacity of the Rake Hill roundabout, thereby, thereby adding to already increasing flows at the Borstal Hill roundabout, whilst also adding to likely pedestrian flows. The application does nothing to address the known and documented hazards for pedestrians and cyclists trying to cross Borstal Hill there. The application should therefore be refused permission unless the applicants can provide an acceptable solution. Please note that the applicants have not assessed the adverse impact of their proposals on pedestrians and cyclists around and between the Borstal Hill and Rake roundabouts. These should be investigated before any decision is made on granting permission. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I ask Valerie Kenny to come to speak next? Thank you. Good evening. I'm speaking to you both as a resident um, who lives off Thanet Way and has lived there for nearly 20 years, and as a previous councillor of Goral Ward. I am deeply concerned about the application to build even more houses along the Thanet Way. The latest application would see at least another 220 dwellings. I am deeply concerned about the impact of such dense housing on our lives, our health and our well-being and the continuous impact on our already failing infrastructure and lack of public transport. The site lights, lies outside of the town boundary and is countryside. The plot has been farmed continuously since 1797 and in normal circumstances it would be refused by the council, HD4 of the plan, unless development was for agricultural use. The last 10 years has seen the council permit development on the land north of Thanet Way, Woodstable Heights, and three further sites, Church Road and two sites either side of Harriet Lodge. Taken with this application, this is over 1,200 new houses in the space of half, half a square mile. All of these were outside the local plan and several of them were outside of the town boundary. Yet the Council's own policy, OS9, of our local plan suggests protecting open space along the Thanet Way has positive amenity value for local residents and acts as a buffer alongside the Thanet Way. This level of development is unsustainable. I refer you to policy SP1 of the local plan. Encouraging healthy living enhances well-being, supports green infrastructure and promotes public transport. What public transport along the Thanet Way? It's non-existent. MPPF 11. Plans and decisions should apply a prescription in favour of sustainable development. Continued lack of progress in South Canterbury and the suspension of local plan means that Whitstable has become a target for developers. It's actually a bit like the Wild West out there. None of these applicants would have even been previously considered. None of them. Loss of green belt and greenfield sites for housing negatively affects the environmental releasing carbon from the land and losing that land ability to capture new carbon. Wildlife and plant, plant life under stress are displaced and loss of green spaces has a negative effect on communities. I refer you to MPPF 12, MPPF 120, DBE 3 and DBE 9. 
Yet on Thursday, the 19th of October, you, Canterbury City Councillors, unanimously voted to declare a biodiversity emergency. All 36 councillors supported the declaration and the de demonstration of their commitment through championing short and long-term actions across the council that will together contribute to delivering nature's recovery. Woodstable desperately needs housing, decent housing, built to the highest standards, where residents can put down roots, see their children walk to local schools, walk and cycle to local amenities, use well-run affordable transport, enjoy open spaces, take pride in a distinctive community, and all of them at a price which people can afford. Affordable homes in Whitstable are really a good laugh because most people can't afford them. We need community-led housing. We need um, better transport. We have very bad transport. I urge you to look at housing as a cohesive whole rather than these one-off applications and live up to your biodiversity emergency declaration. Thank you. And um, Alan Nutton is our next speaker, if you'd like to come forward. Thank you. Well, I've got two uh, principal objections. Uh, the first is uh, road safety. Traffic has increased on Mill Street Road since the Whitstable Heights began to be occupied. It will likely increase further once they are fully occupied. If this development is approved, traffic will increase further. Pedestrian safety is already marginal along Mill Strood Road, especially near the Tesco's roundabout where the pavement is very narrow, so much so that it is only single file and barely suitable for those with mobility aids. Crossing the road is difficult at times, especially at the Bellevue Road Junction, heavily used by children coming or going from school. A pedestrian crossing should be provided here before any furthering housing development is approved. Another crossing may be needed nearer the roundabout, depending on how the pavement is improved. Completion of the Whitstable Heights and this proposal would increase use of this road by school children, making pedestrian way improvements vital. The uh, officers um, highlighted this need in his orange route. Proposed improvements to the pedestrian and cycling way along the Old Thanet Way are welcomed, including the connection to the Crab and Winkle Way. However, these will increase the use of the route towards Ballstall Hill and beyond. Ballstall Hill is already difficult to cross at even moderately busy times, so some kind of safe pedestrian and cyclist crossing must be provided before any increase of its use is initiated. That's the uh, officer's pink route. Draft Condition 11 deals with archaeology. I suggest it needs strengthening in a number of areas. Firstly, references to other than demolition should be removed since there's nothing to, uh, on the site to demolish. This will emphasise that nothing should be done until an approved plan, investigations, excavations and public reports have been completed. This site was the centre of one of Whitstable history's most significant events in 1910. Thousands of tro troops fought a battle on the application site. They will have left many metallic artefacts. I don't know whether the site has been detected in the past, but to discover what artefacts remain, the archaeological requirement should include a systematic metal detecting survey before any field survey is undertaken. I'm confident this could be arranged via the National Council for Metal Detecting if the developer is unable to do so. I'm rather cynical about the completeness of planning archaeology requirements to date. On a recent site, I could see from the road a number of trenches appear to have darkened areas. These might suggest earlier excavations of for middens, huts, ditches, etc. But the trenches were quickly backfilled and construction wasn't far behind. It is vital that the archaeology on this site is properly investigated and reported open to public scrutiny before any development is undertaken or approved. Sustainability issues like sewage, schools, surface water, etc., will be covered by others. Even though I'm concerned about these, I can't fit them into my time slot. Thank you. 
Um, and the next speaker is Richard <coughs> Barrett, Wistful Society. Thank you. Chair, councillors, <clears throat> I'm making this presentation on behalf of the Whitstable Society and I'll specifically focus on highway safety and congestion. The effects of this application on the Old Thanet Way is of particular importance. This is the major artery for Whitstable and congestion on this road can lead to difficulty in entering and leaving Whitstable as well as increasing traffic on residential roads and in Whitstable Town Centre. We are particularly concerned about congestion and safety at the Longreach Roundabout. Over the last 10 years, Canterbury City Council have approved numerous applications in this vicinity, including shops and medical facilities at Estuary View, and nearly a thousand homes, most still being built, and therefore traffic volumes will therefore rise. I want to concentrate first on safety. A letter from Kent County Council Highways on the Canterbury City Council planning website cites risk of collision and visibility problems at the informal pedestrian crossing over Bostal Hill near the roundabout. This is a route used by children walking and cycling to school. The applicant's proposal increases vehicle traffic here and seeks to increase pedestrian use also. But even the applicant's own safety audit alludes to a problem. Every time the council ap approve more development along the Thanet Way in Whitstable, this problem becomes worse. Secondly, congestion. There appears to be a significant problem in the applicant's most recent transport and highway notes. This predicts average traffic queues, uh, af average traffic queue length on Borstal Hill will be less than those that we see today, and significantly less than the measured queues in the applicant's original transport agreement. This states that queues were sometimes too long to be measured. It is unclear why the roundabout has suddenly become less congested in the applicant's transport modelling. It doesn't appear to be connected with diverting traffic through sea salter, but it may be that KCC highways were provided with incorrect data. We would therefore request that the modelling be revisited before any, any uh, final decision is made. So other important points to note. The park and ride scheme has, twice, uh, has been tr tried twice but was economically unviable. In this iteration, it is clearly in the wrong place and would add traffic to the Old Thanet Way and to Longreach Roundabout. The closest bus stop is for the number five which is outside Tesco's, and is too infrequent to be useful to anyone using the park and ride. There are no footpaths on the south side of the Old Thanet Way, apart from a short stretch from Golden Hill to Tesco's. So to get anywhere safely requires crossing the Thanet Way. The applicants make light of the distance to major amenities. They say themselves that, there are further, uh, that they are further than most people would walk, and that doesn't take into account the safety of crossing and recrossing an increasingly busy road. Yes, finally, this development is not connected to an overall local plan that takes into account the need for all residents and is not a sustainable location. In conclusion, apart from the unproven effects on congestion and displaced traffic, this application will be detrimental to highway safety at the Longreach, Longreach roundabout. Uh, and this will be contrary to the MPPF and we therefore ask that you reject this application. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the next speaker is Neil Boddy, Thanet Way Residents Association. Thank you. Hi, I'm speaking on behalf of Thanet Way Residents Association. Sustainable development does not compromise the ability of future ge generations to meet their own needs. I'm going to explain why the application is not sustainable. The application site is not just a piece of incidental land, but an important piece of strategic land that forms part of the holistic planning strategy that brought us the new Thanet Way bypass. This strategy recognised that a congested Thanet Way is materially harmful to the economic prosperity 
of the coastal towns. As part of the new bypass, the council did not want to see a return of the build-up of traffic on the old Thanet Way, so did not want development on areas of undeveloped fringe land, including the application site, because that would lead to extra traffic and accesses onto the road. CCC said that any such additional traffic would lead to calls for the upgrading of the road, which is contrary to the approved approach of diverting traffic onto the, uh, onto the new bypass. Control measures were thus introduced to specifically restrict development on the adjacent land to future-proof the existing road. So fringe land outside the urban boundary, such as this site, was protected by virtue of a presumption against development and land inside the urban boundary through a designation of protected open space. At the time, CCC said they had strongly rejected any option that would allow infill development between the existing Thanet Way and the new bypass. The scheme recognised that when the bypass was introduced, only 50% of traffic would ever come off. When that analysis was done, they measured around 25,000 vehicles per day. Today's stats show that the figure is already close to that, and we haven't seen the impact yet of the 500 homes currently under construction along this stretch, plus the knock-on effects of all the additional interventions planned. Indeed, the poor sustainability of this site for pedestrian access routes compounds the problem. This is undesirable for road users, local residents and the town as a whole because more traffic, pollution and noise will spill into the residential roads as drivers seek new paths of least resistance. The other principal intent of this strategy is to retain the visual amenity pr pr provided by the open plan semi-rural character and as green infrastructure to mitigate the harsh adverse effects of the busy road. The site is a prominent link in a wider change of pockets of open land that accomplish this effect. In summary, when the bypass was created, plans specifically included control measures to future-proof the old Thanet Way Road to prevent the requirement for road enlargement, enlargement because there will be nowhere to expand the old Thanet Way into without expensive compulsory purchases. The acute risk is that this, is, this piecemeal addition causes us to sleepwalk into the eventual need to upgrade the road. To circumvent the local plan, the reasons need to be sustainable and compelling. The application is on a site expressly identified to have a presumption against development because of the key role in the scheme that brought us the new Thanet Way bypass, on the very land on which undertakings were given not to infill because of its key role. Not only are there no material considerations for granting, the scheme does not offer credible sustainability credentials that demonstrably outweigh the harm. Data from Imperial College on sewage spillage confirms capacity at Swalecliff treatment works wind up, please. Thank is, is insufficient and the planned reconfiguration does not equate to an increase in the works design capacity, so this should be looked into before committing. There are clear reasons for refusing. If you have any doubts, please could we get an inspector to look at this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so could I now ask uh, Councillor Chris Cornell to come and speak? Thank you. Hmm. Hello, colleagues. I think you've got a long night ahead of you. Um, but, and it's a, a difficult uh, decision, but I, uh, I did just want to pick up on a few things. The, the first thing to say is this is a difficult site to develop. It's essentially on a busy arterial road, which is the lifeblood of Whitstable. People travel on it two or three days uh, on average. The developers tried very hard, I believe, to develop a site which is on a very steeply banked uh, uh, location and they have been communicative whilst there's a lot of comments essentially on the planning portal it's important to say that the original plans are not what we're considering now and there are some good things on it there's a, a 30 percent worth of affordable housing including the first capped first homes in Whitstable there's a commitment to a bus first strategy and I think the more recent stuff from Kent County Council over the last couple of months shows a real kind of uh, uh, shift there's substantively improved bike access uh, along the Thanet Way and the signalisation of the Borstal Hill roundabout, I think, will improve uh, resident safety. However, one of the problems about the Thanet Way, as Neil alluded to, is it's a bit of a delicate ecosystem. Um, and historically, we've been quite myopic. We've dealt with individual sites and we've asked Kent County Council what they think the tra transport infrastructure is. They've said it's sufficient, but we've built so many different developments along the Thanet Way that we really haven't looked at it in its entirety. 
for Bolstow Hill Roundabout is at the level in 1991 where Kent County Council went, stop, we need a new Thanet Way in order to be able to, uh, to deal with uh, that issue. It's already at capacity and there's already, and there's a number of schemes along the Thanet Way which are still to come off. Whilst this development does see a solution to it, improving some of the uh, signalisation at the Bolster Hill roundabout, I think essentially that it doesn't deal with a few things. First, it doesn't really account for the flow on the Thanet Way East and how pedestrian, additional uh, pedestrian crossings will be affected. This is a 50 mile an hour road and suddenly putting more additional uh, uh, pedestrian crossings along it is gonna cause people to kind of bunch up, so, uh, so to speak. It will reflect, it doesn't reflect the increase in traffic that we can expect from a park and bus service. They're not included in the uh, figures. And whilst there's information on demand at the Borsa Hill roundabout, particularly in the morning and the afternoon, there's no reflection on seasonal traffic. And at the moment, we all know that cars queue up on the A299 in the summer because essentially there's no, uh, there's no issue. KCC do acknowledge that there's traffic problems. Uh, they rank delays in the morning as a D and they do rank delays in the evening as an F overnight at 60 seconds. There's no, however, consideration for how that backing up of traffic on the Borsley Hill would affect the subsequent uh, roads for where people need to uh, come on and come off. And I think the modelling requires more corroboration. It effectively says over the next five years we should collect information on traffic counts, acknowledging that we're still not entirely sure what's going on. But yes, at the end of those five years, it's only going to use that information to review the traffic plan of the developer. It won't give us any additional money to essentially fix a problem if we discover it after five, uh, five years. The report states that they're only in circumstances where there is unacceptable impacts on highway safety or the residual cumul cumulative impacts of the road network would be severe. Can proposals be refused on highways grounds? Officers say that they are on non I simply say we don't know. And rolling the dice on this scheme without clearer ideas about the traffic modelling and its effect would be unwise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Councillor Clare Turnbull, thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm speaking as Councillor for Goral Ward this evening. Um, you've heard a lot of detailed arguments against this proposal tonight. A lot of people are concerned about the incoherent sprawl of development around Whitstable and have worked very hard to consider the impact that this and the many uh, planned and future proposals will have on our town and our residents. I'm aiming to give some more general observations and back for background. Whitstable, of course, is a very compact town centre served by a single narrow linear main shopping street. Continually adding on and adding on housing is unsustainable for our town. It also results in housing developments with no real identity of their own, no local doctor, school, shops and cafes in easy walking distance. For all the talk of increased walking and cycleways and possible bus routes, which aren't yet guaranteed and will depend on financial considerations, the reality is that most people will get in their cars to shop, take the kids to school and go to work because those facilities are not otherwise convenient. It's true that housing is desperately needed, but does that mean snatching at opportunities to put a load of housing on a piece of land? Is that sustainable? The new local plan is an opportunity to take a good look at planning for the benefit of the district and put quality of life and environment first, ensuring that housing mix responds first and foremost to local need. The MPPF says one, of this, one strand of sustainable development is social. This presumably means creating communities, not housing outposts of a small nearby town, which is already under immense pressure. The benefits of this site are, presumably, providing housing. As it's not primarily the, des the desperately locally needed social housing and starter homes, I argue that the harm to the local area does not outweigh the benefits. My main objections to the sustainability of this application are also environmental. Uh, we've heard in terms of roads, the traffic is increasing on the Thanet Way. This is without Whistable Height being anywhere near complete. With other developments in the pipeline, pressure is going to increase. There are regularly long queues coming along from the 299 and having a park and bus on this site will not alleviate those problems. In terms of sewage, when the report reads that Southern Water says that they can facilitate foul sewage disposal to service the proposed development, it means that it is possible to connect the development to the sewage system. It is not a statement related to their capacity to ensure that they stop sewage outages into our sea and rivers. The system is already overloaded. A couple of points on the conditions, uh, biodiversity net gain, why is there no mention of this? The site is partly justified because it is in the draft local plan and it will be started when the new plan is live. Let's get ahead with the pro-environmental conditions we are committed to now. 
Hard surfaces must be kept to an absolute minimum, both to minimise surface water runoff and to give opportunities for planting, and must be permeable to encourage drainage, including the proposed car park. New homes must be built to the highest possible standards of insulation to control energy usage and costs. Overall, please consider this application in the light of all the other developments planned around Whitstable. As Chris argues, the cumulative impact of piecemeal developments is not sustainable for our small town. Thank you. Um, thank you. And Councillor Steve Wheeler. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, I shall be brief. You've heard many fine and detailed arguments against why this shouldn't happen. I'm just going to put something that's very common sense. I can't find a single person in Whitstable who's in favour of this. In fact, I can't find a single person in Whitstable who's in favour of the Whitstable Heights development. They say, this is ruined Whitstable already. Okay, and they live there, so they should know. So to plonk some Lego houses on the other side of the road, and this is a fast road, this is a road you can walk along and you will find dead wildlife on it, brown hares that live on the proposed site. They try and cross to where they used to gamble across Whitstable Heights. This is not just a, a bit of farmland there. We have a biodiversity emergency. What is this going to do? It can't be mitigated by plonking a few trees and a bit of hedge next to a car park where there's going to be 300 plus cars waiting for a bus that's never going to arrive. We can't get a bus to West Review. You can't walk from this place to the train station. You can't walk to the nearest doctors saying it's 18, 20 minutes. People don't walk there. What you're going to do is create masses more traffic. You've heard the detail specs on this. It's going to choke Whitstable. It's going to ruin the countryside. Views from this you'll be able to see from miles away. So that nice pretty diagram you saw with the, with the, the pointy thing saying here's Millstrood Road. Anyone that knows Millstrood Road, it's permanently shut. You cannot go down it. It's been <laughs> dug up. I, I haven't, you know, I live there. I don't think it's been open for six months for more than two days. We know, so the people which will say, we know this is going to have an adverse effect. I'll leave you clever people to find the details of why you can reject this. I'm just saying, don't let it go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you. And um, finally, uh, we've got uh, Victoria Groves um, from... Catesby Estates. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, Councillors. It's not my intention to repeat the detail within the comprehensive report prepared by your officers. However, there are a number of matters which I'd like to highlight to the committee tonight. This development will deliver green homes. We've committed to delivering net zero carbon ready homes, which will meet the future home standard in advance of the 2025 government timetable. This means the homes will be all electric and will be fitted with solar panels, air source heat pumps, A-grade appliances, EV charging facilities and rainwater harvesting devices. The development will deliver much needed policy compliant affordable housing whilst respecting the surrounding environment. The new homes will be set within a green and lush environment which encourages walking and cycling and provides direct connections onto the local bus and footpath network to assist with easy access to nearby key facilities and the town centre. Off-site highway works include upgrading 1.5 kilometres of footway along Thanet Way to provide a three metre wide shared footway cycleway, along with funding to provide additional improvements to pedestrian and cycle linkages to the town centre. We're also funding the local bus service and providing a new bus stop on Thanet Way. There will be a regular bus service which will provide access to the nearby facilities, railway station and the town centre. The on-site green open space accounts for 44% of the total site. The proposals will provide both equipped and informal areas of play, as well as important landscape planting to achieve a 26% biodiversity net gain. These proposals will provide community benefits for both the existing and new residents. There is a proposed 400 square meter area which can accommodate either a new local shop or community facility. The proposals also include the provision for land for a future 300 space park and bus facility. 
This is a long-standing ambition of the Council and is in reference in the adopted local plan. This car park will form part of a wider strategic transport strategy to assist with alleviating congestion in the town centre. Visitors to Whitstable will be encouraged to park at the car park and catch the bus into town. There is also the opportunity to provide bike hire facilities to take advantage of the improved cycle connections and linkages onto the Crab and Winkle Way. We're also providing new allotments to meet identified local need. We believe this application will deliver high quality um, homes within an attractive green environment, as well as provide much needed affordable homes and genuine community benefits. Thank you for listening and we respectfully request you support your officer's recommendation and approve this application. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've actually had quite a lot of information from everybody and there's a fairly lengthy report to discuss. Um, so I'm not rushing to the proposal, but suggesting that we have some discussion to absorb um, everything that we've heard. That's quite a lot of material. Um, so I'd like to actually open this uh, application for general discussion um, and uh, your opinions. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Stockley. Thank you. Dependable as ever. Um, yeah, the bus space, the 300 proposed parking spaces, um, we've heard that uh, on one side there are no buses and on the other side the developer is proposing presumably to fund a bus service. That's the impression I got from the last speaker. I'm wondering, this space is going to be an eighth of the total area, the car park. If there are no bus services forthcoming, is it going to be left green? You know, what's what's planned for this space? Because obviously, immediately there are no. You know, we've got stagecoach, bless them, um, and we haven't got any buses. So, what's going to be, assuming planning permission is granted, what will this be space look like before the buses arrive? Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm going to ask um, Andrew to answer. Thank you, Chair. So essentially the intention for the park and bus area you saw in that plan is for it to be transferred to the council so that the council can pursue kind of an opportunity in future to deliver a park and bus or a park and ride service. In the interim, because the land would have been transferred to the council, it ultimately would be on the council to determine what, you know, kind of how the land would be kept kind of up until the point, you know, when they potentially intend to deliver a park and bus or park and ride service. So there's there's nothing kind of set in stone for the interim period between when the land was transferred, well, would be transferred and when a park and ride might be delivered on site. But that would be a council decision, so it would be within council control. May I come back on that, Chair? Yes, do. Thank you. So basically you're saying that the land ownership effectively River or goes to the council, this council. Um, so there will be no opportunity to, to, for the developer to say in six months, a year's time, oh, look, there are no buses, let's bung some houses on here. Um, also, I'm concerned that we might get some security fencing stuck up round it, a massive collection of litter. And, uh, you know, obviously for wildlife, we need open spaces, but that large area in the middle of this development fronting the Thanet Way, if left to its own devices, is going to look like an eyesore. So what I'm asking for is some commitment from this council as to what they're going to do with it. Is it going to be mowed? You know, what is it before it's a car park? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, we could have some comments um, from other people first and then come back to some general transport issues, I think. Um, Councillor Prentice, you wanted to come in. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I am broadly in favour of the park and bus concept. Um, I do share some of Councillor Stockley's concerns about the site because it's yet to be fully defined. Um, and actually, leaving aside the housing element of this um, for a moment, um, and I think a 300 space facility that prevents car traffic from clogging up the town in the peak of summer, in particular peak of summer, 
I think it will make an enormous difference if we are able to displace that kind of traffic because I think a lot of people are discouraged from visiting the town because who might otherwise be visitors because it 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 becomes so congested and difficult to move around um the in um the officer's report and andrew's report there is a um a reference to 192,000 pounds um from uh the developer to uh stagecoach now my question would be how far does an amount like that go to supporting a viable turn up and go regular frequency bus service um my my view is that a proper bus service needs to be in place from the moment the first person hypothetically moved in to a home on this development um because we think without it without that sort of sustainable transport it'd be very difficult to support um there is vague talk of improvements to bus services in Whitstable from the likes of our monopoly provider, Stagecoach Southeast. Um, there are other providers in the area, but very few. Um, we don't really know yet what that bus service looks like, how it would link up the amenities um, such as Estuary View, such as Tesco, such as um, the town centre. So it become it is at the moment a very vague proposal and it's a very vague aspiration we will put in some sort of bus service at some point well um i think people need more reassurance than that and um rather than just an unserviced isolated car park on the edge of a an arterial road at the moment it doesn't do it for me and i can see where people's concerns come from i'll address some of the other matters i think later in the debate Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much. Um, Councillor McKenzie, the next person. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to pick up on one of the more dry and legislative bits, I think. So the, in the officer's report, it admits that this proposal doesn't actually adhere to policy SD4, and it doesn't fit with uh, the criteria laid out for HD4. Um, so... They justified that this development would be built outside of the urban part of Whitstable, despite not fitting with the rural criteria in HD4, because it's directly adjacent to the urban part of Whitstable and there's easy access to it. But I'm not sure I can really accept that justification, because it's like if I was going to park a car, would it be right to park it on the grass verge next to the parking space because it's directly next to it? It seems a little bit, you know, tenuous as as a justification to me so i'm not really sure we could call this compliant with local plan policy is what i want to say so could that be clarified um i think we have to be really clear that we're not we're in presumption in terms of the current local plan um and there are several paragraphs in this that address that um council mckenzie and uh, so in fact we the fact that it is, you know, outside the urban area, the fact that it doesn't comply with that is not actually a consideration that we can take today. Unfortunately, um, we're in that situation. It's it's not one we want to be in, but uh, but that's where we are. Um, could I? I think there's a number of other people. I have a couple of comments myself. Um, so uh, let me see. Um, well, okay, I've got a few people. Just let me have a look at order here. Um, uh, Councillor Mellish, then Councillor Castle, then Councillor Bothwell. That's the order. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, mine is just really is a, is a short question in some ways. We've had a lot of contradiction and information about transport, about traffic rather, uh, along the stretch between uh, Longreach and, uh, and Bustle Hill. Um, and it seems that I would, like to, I, I would like some more information about the transport modelling that was used. We've been told that there's going to be less transport despite the development than there was uh, early information about what the, the use of that, of that uh, stretch of road. Um, I'd like to know about how, how it was used, how that sort of information uh, about a less transport is possible, less, less cars, less usage, um, given that we're going to put up over 200 houses uh, on that site. Thank you. I'll take another, these other couple of comments and then add a couple of my own and then I think come back. So if you could make a note of where we're going with this. So that was on the transport modelling. Thank you. 
Um, Councillor Castle. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just, just a quick comment. I'm reading through the documents. Um, obviously, I'm substituting for Dan Smith. It's very hot on the environmental side. It was mentioned by a few objectors. Is that Southern Water have specifically said they haven't got a problem at the Swalecliff site, but it's quite publicly known only in September of this year that they are discharging into the sea. Um, I've actually got the data, which is 22 days worth, 529 hours of sewage. Um, so these 220 houses, if the data was multiplied up, would add 1.4 million hours, um, litres of sewage to the to the sea there. So I'm slightly confused how the consultation can say they're quite happy to take on those extra homes. So I just wanted to query that. I think it looks a bit disingenuous of Southern Water to say we've got capacity when they clearly haven't and they publicly admitted it and paid a fine. So I was slightly confused about that in, in the officer's report. Not on his personal opinion, obviously Southern's, but thank you. Yes, quite complicated things about what capacity the, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll ask um, for that to be clarified as much as we can. Um, and Councillor Bothwell. Thank you, Chair. Um, just uh, three just questions of clarification, really. One is the location of the allotments. Um, doesn't seem to be the best place for allotments to be right alongside the, the old Thanet Way when they're growing food with the air pollution uh, in that location. And I wondered why that has been selected uh, and wouldn't be better for the food growing to take place elsewhere. Also, it seems that it has a separate vehicle access, uh, which could presumably lead to greater traffic problems just, just before the roundabout, um, which doesn't seem to be ideal from a traffic point of view. Uh, second point, although I'm familiar with garden cities and the principles of garden cities, I wondered whether the condition, proposed condition saying that development should be built according to garden city principles is a technical condition? Uh, is there a particular document that uh, would be referred to in that, um, in imposing that condition? And the third point is, I very much welcome uh, the electric only development, the PV panels, heat pumps, etc., uh, which is very welcome. But why are, why are the houses to be net zero ready uh, rather than net zero? Because as we all know, we are living in a world which is burning before our eyes. So why are we building net zero ready houses rather than net zero houses? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, we can cover all of those things. I just wanted to make a few comments myself. I mean, I, I felt that um, we heard some good things from the applicant to meet some of the issues. I totally appreciate the point Councillor Bothwell has just made, um, but there is, you know, having net zero ready is better than a lot of the ones we've got at the moment, and we haven't yet brought in the new local plan. We will have a design guide in that, but we're not there yet. I mean, so we, you know, we're going in that direction, but, you know, we are not there yet. But this was, a, and I think if that could be a condition um, that the applicant was describing, I think that would be good. Um, and the other one was the, I think she said, the applicant said 26% biodiversity net gain. And I think that as we are bringing in a 20%, although the government's only bringing in 10%, I think it, it would be reasonable to put the 20% in and that then we, can hold the applicant to that. Um, those two conditions, I think. Um, I, I think we need a bit more information on the current state of transport and buses. Um, we are in a very difficult position with this application um, because it is a site that is in the new local plan, but that has not come into effect. Um, and the current one is, we're in presumption, so it, it doesn't apply, but I think we can have um, some of the standards um, from the current local plan, which I think, you know, answers the question about um, Garden City um, criteria. It's got good open space. And I think if we get that addressed a little bit more, um, that, that might help. I understand there's money from um, the Whitstable Heights for a bus as well. Um, and of course, you know, we are aiming to put that um, park and bus in it. But as other people have raised, when is that going to be? What's the time scale for that? So if I could just add my questions and now perhaps ask um, the officer to, 
to start to answer some of our questions. Um, would that be all right? And I don't know if Simon, you want to come in as well. Um, Andrew, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll start with kind of really the public transport angle, I suppose. So kind of as the Chair just mentioned, there's a pot of money that was secured as part of the Whitstable Heights development, um, which was essentially to kind of facilitate the kickstart of a bus service through that site. The 192,500 that is referenced in the report would essentially top that amount up. So that's at the moment, there's no certainty necessarily around kind of where the bus will go and kind of how it would move. But what this application is seeking to do is essentially contribute towards that pool of money so that it can facilitate kind of the KCC and stagecoach negotiations to secure a bus service in the future. So that's kind of where that's looking really. Uh, just remind me if I've forgotten anything, but Councillor Mellish mentioned something about kind of transport modelling and the impacts on the long reach roundabout. And essentially the modelling that's been carried out kind of assesses the baseline kind of traffic as it is and then tops it up with committed development in the area and then tops it up again with the expected traffic impacts arising from this development on top of that and when KCC Highways reviewed the modelling that had been carried out for that particular roundabout they concluded ultimately that whilst there would be a delay I think it was in the PM peak um, from the Borstal Hill arm actually it wasn't severe. So when you refer back to that MPPF test um, around severity of transport impacts and kind of enabling you to refuse things, what we've got is we've got a comment from KCC essentially setting out that it doesn't meet that severity criteria. It doesn't meet, it's not so harmful that it would, um, in the MPPF terms, warrant refusal on that point. Um, what I'll do, I'll move on to the Southern Water point. So you're right, Councillor Castle, they, the Southern Water did refer to um, being able to accommodate the development. Essentially, Southern Water, there's a legal obligation um, on Southern Water to provide capacity for new development. So it's not, it's not necessarily something in planning terms we have control over because it's covered under separate legislation. Um, so really, that's kind of the point around foul water. So Southern Water, they have to provide they have to provide a connection to new development. It's a legal obligation on them. Um, there was the point around the left in left out and the allotment and the possible transport impacts arising from that. So that was something that KCC flagged initially, um, kind of people coming in east, kind of from west to east, turning right into the allotments and it holding traffic up kind of on the westward approach. So basically the applicant amended the plan so that the allotments ultimately will be a left in left out arrangement. The detail of that, so we've got the basic principle left in left out so that people wouldn't necessarily stop the traffic and the further detail kind of around visibility, et cetera, will be secured at the reserve matter stage so that KC highways would review that access into the allotments um, at that point. There was also the point I think about the position of the allotments, um, it's just kind of you typically see kind of allotments next to kind of busy roads and junctions um i know that there's one in tankerton that's kind of next to the thunnet way you've got one in Ham bay that's next to the thunnet way so it's not kind of a peculiar location for allotments it's it's fairly typical so there wasn't necessarily an objection to the location of that um and then there was also the point around the net zero ready and rather than saying net zero ready being net zero um we've secured an energy strategy condition essentially following the principles of the existing energy statement that was submitted which is seeking the 100 percent improvement above pile building rigs um, for 2021 on carbon emissions um so any future development we would expect to meet those aspirations that's that's what they set that's what they've told us at the outline stage moving forwards see technology will advance and we'll get better um, but ultimately that's what we're intending to secure we're intending to secure those improvements above building regs pile um, yeah that's really it I think is there anything else chair uh, no I think that's fine um, do we have any other queries uh, David uh, uh, sorry Councillor Thomas thank you chair um, a few 
comments and questions. I mean, the biggest problem that we've got on this area and this site is because we are in presumption um, and we've got the situation with Stodmarsh, which means basically the only development we can have in this district is Whitstable because that's linked to Swellcliffe. So that's why these sites are coming forward because we can't refuse these sites because they're they're, they're coming forward because we're in, we're in presumption the government say we've got to build and we, we're not building enough houses in the district and a lot of that is down because of, of the situation with the water um a couple of questions and a couple of comments i suppose when you're looking at um the park and ride access i'm assuming the the site will be allocated for the 300 vehicles they're shown on the plan I'm assuming the buses need to access that site from the Thanet Way going into the site to get onto the actual park and ride area where people will park. So a couple of comments there. So you're gonna have a, you come in from the Thanet Way at the moment, you, the, the ideal situation would be to have a, a park and ride on the industrial site, but that's, that's the, those sites are gone. So we've missed an opportunity there of, of actually gaining some land on that side of it is on the new local plan that's coming forward is there a, a provision for a park and ride site for Whitstable because if it's something that's needed this is an opportunity to actually gain a site for that if it's deemed we don't need a Whitstable doesn't want or doesn't require a park and ride site then that, that goes out the, out the equation because if it's not needed it's it's irrelevant because it can be a dead duck but that is also going to increase the traffic flow of traffic it won't decrease the traffic flow coming off the slip road so you're still going to have traffic delayed off the slip road because they will come into it anyway because it's a popular town what it will increase the traffic flow of possibility of up to 500 vehicles 300 for the park and ride and 200 for the residents from the, from the actual site AI at the moment towards the the uh, long reach roundabout so that will increase that that roundabout and which could make that roundabout dangerous or more more pedestrianized it's very difficult i mean loads of people have spoken tonight and councillors have spoken tonight and where the planning committee to decide whether this goes forward or or, or doesn't or gets it gets <laughs> gets um, overturned the, the problem is i'm not hearing any real reasons for refusing this application and it's partly because we're in, in presumption at the moment so i don't really have any comments apart from the park and ride if that's on a local plan it's something that we're looking for which the ball then that's a bonus if it's something that's not needed we've been offered something that we don't actually need i don't know what's coming forward thank you chair Sorry, I haven't got my... Uh, thank you, um, Councillor. I'm just going to ask um, Simon, Head of Planning, just to comment on, on that situation and the, the, the future local plan and where we are with all of that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. The, yeah, this site um, does include the land for the park and ride in the draft local plan. Um, this is the preferred option for that um, park and ride facility to be provided. Uh, this application does give that opportunity uh, to secure that land uh, from the council. The developer is, is offering to gift that land to the council. So this is an opportunity to gain that land, um, which was set out in the draft local plan. Uh, Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, th um, thank you to the officer for the, uh, his report and to all the speakers have come tight. Um, for me, my starting point really is um, if we're in presumption of grant we, and you find a place or a site which is just unacceptable, that is the, ch that is the challenge. The challenge is actually, is this going to do more harm to the site if we were to give permission than not? And, f and for me, it's a wonderful piece of arable land. It's grade three, grows crops year in, year out, serves the public in one sure way or another. And it was too easy given up. 
once it's gone, it's gone. And um, unfortunately for me in that particular thing, I, find I have a struggle with that particular issue. Also, we talk about sustainability. Now, the park and ride, for example, um, this site, is it, is it going to be sustainable if you don't have that park and ride? <laughs> this, this is an outline out planning application. Nothing is actually set in stone. We haven't got in front of us even a design of a house, a colour of a brick, a shape of a tile of a roof. And yet we're being asked to actually judge this site and go forward with permission where, correct me if I'm wrong, if it gets permission tonight, this committee won't see that application again. It'll be reserved matters and, and, and that would then continue down that vein. And my, my concern is with the sustainability of all what people spoke about, and that was the biggest thing what people spoke about tonight, um, if we don't get the, the bus, you know, we're actually ironically factoring in a, a park and ride to make a site sustainable. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it doesn't kind of add up in my mind, it doesn't square that circle. You know, people will, if they go shopping, I know the area really well, Tesco's, no, no one's walking to Tesco's to get their shopping. They might walk to pick up a paper, but they'll go in a car. It, it, for me, it's not a sustainable site. It's a perfectly good arable site. For, and like it has been since, I think someone mentioned to 1700s. And, I, and just listening to everybody tonight and my colleagues and the colleagues here, that's how I feel about it. I feel that there, I'm not a NIMBY, it's not the right site to build houses on, there's my view. And, and, and it's not a sustainable site, whether you drive, you have to drive from it and to it. it. It's just not, as far as I'm concerned. And I would argue that case, and particularly if we're going to, on reserve matters, not even actually have set in stone this park and ride, which we don't know who's even going to turn up. Um, we've got sites in, in Herne Bay from my area where we've got completely built and we still haven't got a bus service running through it. That's nobody's fault other than what's gone. So I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced you can make it sustainable even by giving people £500 vouchers to either buy a bicycle or use public transport. It doesn't, it doesn't stack up for me. Um, <clears throat> again, the positives, and I'll be Mr Negative all right, the positives, I think the builds of the house with solar, electric energy, affordable homes, but that's another issue. I've never known an affordable home in the last 10 years. You're getting Whitstable, to be fair. But the commitment to it is a good commitment, and the commitment to the style regarding the heating and uh, electricity in houses is, is a good commitment. We can secure it. So that's my, my personal views and my feelings on it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Jones. Um, I think there's a couple of things we, we probably do want to say on this, which is that um, the, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, I, I'll just, yeah, um, which is that um, the, the, the park and bus is not to make the site sustainable. It, they're two separate things. This will be part of a legal agreement and it's, it's part of our longer term, as it were, our, uh, you know, the, the council's strategy to have um, park, park, bus, uh, sorry, parks um, with bus or park and ride, um, as they are in Canterbury, um, in um, in sustainable sites. And this, but it's not to make the site sustainable. That's what I'm trying to get at. They are two separate things. That would be a legal agreement. Um, it's something that is in the uh, new draft plan. But you've heard about the status of that. Um, I think that um, we need to. Sorry. Um, Councillor Stockley, would you like to come in now? Chair, yeah. I know we've heard a lot of negatives tonight, and you know the, we, those of us who have been around for a few years, have seen this come and go. Um, we know for a fact that we can't refuse on the grounds of transport, whether that be because of congestion on Borstal Hill or whatever, because KCC are the roads authority, and they model it on their computer, and the computer say yes. Everything's fine. The residents won't believe it. Um, to be honest, neither do I. But we can't refuse on those grounds. There are very few grounds we can actually refuse this development on. Personally, looking at this development, I've looked at it very thoroughly, I would be delighted if this development was taking place in my ward rather than the development I have got. You know, the, the sustainability of it is a vast improvement on most 
developments we've seen recently, in my view. We need houses. If we don't build it here, as one of the speakers said, build it elsewhere. The problem is where. You know, it's, it's not Robert Jones that said that this is a marvellous piece of agricultural land. That's what we've got, agricultural land. We haven't got hundreds of brownfield sites. We haven't got the areas that are crying out for development or improvement, shall we say. You know, so I, on balance, I think this is a good development. It does annoy me when we see indicative plans on the screen with about 12 houses. That's not 200, 220 houses illustrated on there, not unless I'm going blind. Um, the other point I'd like to make is it's come to my attention that we have got issues with road adoption in developments that have taken place. I believe the uh, golf course is one of them in Herne Bay where roads are being adopted slowly, if at all. And of course that leaves problems with whose maintenance, who's reinforcing traffic regulations, etc. If these roads are going to be manufactured or built to standards as listed in the report, to KCC specifications, how can we ensure that they are adopted? Because if they're not, we've got all sorts of problems. I've got a lot of sympathy with the, those points, as you know. Um, yes, we have got too many developments where the adoption of roads and the, the way in which they're being built is not working. Um, I would just like to um, suggest that I bring Simon in on reserve matters. Sure. He's, going to, uh, he's going to make a few, couple of comments on reserve matters. Thank you. Yeah, I think to, well, just to pick up the point about reserve matters, um, most applications of this size will come in as outline uh, applications. So you're looking at the, the, the principles of development. You've got a fair amount of detail. You can understand what is being proposed and the, uh, and the associated infrastructure. But the detail, like the design and the layout, will be subject to further applications. But those are uh, equally, you know, like planning applications, and they will be advertised. And you can, if you want to, call those applications in as councillors. Um, so they won't necessarily be determined by officers. You can, you have the right to call those in. So they could appear in front of committee if that's what you choose as councillors. I think. Oh, sorry. Um, Councillor Thomas, do you want to come back in? Yeah, just on the comment of, because of, I kind of get a feeling I know where this vote might have to go. Um, on reserve matters, when it comes to, because we've just been told that some of the trees from the other estate, forgive me, I forget the name of it, um, are, are no longer there and been been removed or they're not surviving or they're dying. Um, can we basically make sure, I mean, I know there's, um, once the planning starts, there's a five-year time lapse of actually, because it come through another site seven, six, six or seven years ago, you know, uh, uh, they have to maintain these sites for, for up to five years. Can we make sure that's, that, that's done through planning controls and stuff like that and checked on the other sites? I know it's something that we, we probably are doing and they probably are going to replace the trees on the other site, but if we can crank that up as well, then it just double-checks on the whole lot of it. Thank you, Chair. I believe we have got that kind of requirement. Condition. We have got that condition. Um, thank you. Um, I completely agree. I think, and you know, I think we also know that we, what we need to be is tougher on that. Um, and um, you know, that I think we all agree. Um, I think what I need to do is um, regretfully actually say that because we're in presumption, I don't think we do have um, sufficient planning reasons given KCC's. Um, position on the transport and given um, some of the positive things that we have understood about this development now um, I had my own question about what was of us coming from um, the um, biodiversity net gain that we're expecting in the new local plan and the net zero homes read, uh, ready um, can we have I would like to propose that we um, accept the officer's recommendation um, which is Section 101 grant subject to safeguarding conditions and completion of the legal agreement. Yes, I do. 
And I want to add two conditions. Um, I know that the applicant was talking about 26% biodiversity net gain, but I think we should go in line with our new local plan and put a requirement for 20% uh, biodiversity net gain. So at least we tie that in. And the um, you know very welcome comments about um, net zero ready homes. Is that the right way to describe it? Um, I'd like that condition as well, and make sure that we have we we. We, make, we secure that. Um, you know, I did think that a lot of the site, I think like some other people, um, did show um, a real, really due regard for what we do need on sites, especially when they're on agricultural land, as many of our as are and will be, because uh, that's what we've got, um, that they do really look at this biodiversity net gain and they look at the wildlife and um, it's possible to do a lot. Um, and this looks as though it's got that opportunity. But as I say, um, it is under presumption. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Stockley. Seconded, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. No, can I make a comment before we go to the vote? Yes, you can comment before we go. To Sorry, the Chair, I know this is too late. It's, a, it's the wrong way around, really. Um, what I was going to propose is actually as one of the conditions moving forward if whether we can actually um, put in a pelican crossing along the Thanet Way as we've had done on the golf course estate I know you've just proposed it and seconded it but I'm just asking if that's if that's something that we can actually condition on this site um we've got Two can crossing. Shall I let the, uh, let, let the officers um, speak to that point? Thank you. Yes, that's right, Chair. There's a, um, a two can crossing going in across where the public right of way was signalised two can crossing. Yeah, but that's a crossing in the centre reservation, is it not? Or are you no. talking? I'm, I'm, I'm requesting as one of the conditions would be a pelican crossing at that site across the Thanet Way so people can access the course safely. Because if we don't put it in now, we're never going to get one. The centre of reservation is not a pelican crossing. I'm, I'm just requesting as a condition. Um, can we just clarify this? I did look these up before I came, but, but I think I should let the officer uh, reply to you. I can share my screen, actually, if that's easier, with the um, token crossing that actually they're intending to install. I don't know if you can see that particularly well. So that's the Toucan Crossing um, that would go basically from the site to the north of the site. It's a very basic image, um, but essentially it would stop, you know, traffic would be stopped and people could cross and cycle across. So that is going to be a Pelican Crossing? Toucan. A what, sorry? A Toucan. It's like a Pelican, but not like a Pelican. <laughs> can I just well, Basically, comment? is it... It's not <coughs> can I just comment? It's... It's better because it's absolutely suitable for cycling as well as walking. And that's why it's two can. Sorry, I looked it up. I thought, you know. I, I, can I have a bit more clarification now? Because I don't know what you're talking about. So a two can crossing, my understanding is that two can cross. So you can have pedestrian and cycle going across the same crossing which is signalised. So to do, excuse me, just to clarify, you're talking about red, yellow, green traffic lights to stop the traffic completely. That's my understanding, yes. Walkers. Uh, uh, okay, that's fine. You, you, as you understand, doesn't, doesn't, when you say, as I understand, does not say yes. <laughs> Um, sorry, I think we need to bring other people in. Uh, Councillor Prentice and then Councillor Mellish. Thank you, Chair. Um, in my remarks earlier, I mentioned that um, I was unsure about the arrangements for the bus service. Um, I would just like to reiterate and, and ask whether this could be a condition that the bus, uh, a bus service is in place 
bef a, a proper regular bus service is in place before the first residents moved into this development because I think bearing in mind the potential for additional car traffic I think you need that condition in place I don't think it's acceptable without it Just one second. I'm just going to discuss this point because it is a good and interesting point to talk about. But, you know, at the moment we have a commitment to money. Um, just a second. I, I think um, uh, Simon Thomas is going to give us a, um, an explanation about what we could do about that. It's not quite what you suggested, but it's something. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, we, we have around about 200,000 contribution from this site, and there's around about 300 from the Whitstable Heights. There's half a million contribution. Um, KCC and Stagecoach um, are, we understand, in discussion. Is that right, Andrew? Um, they're in discussion about um, using that money to kickstart a bus service, uh, but we don't have any. There's been no conclusion to that yet. What we could do, if if committee um, wished, is um, you could uh, re 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 um, re resolve to ask me to write to Kent County Council to express um, the uh, desire of the planning committee um, for them to reach a conclusion that would result in uh, a bus service being provided before first occupation, so we can express the, the, the views of the committee. And could we put that in the committee minutes as we've yeah. and in, as an informative? Yeah. So we put that in the committee minutes, that's a commitment then. Could I come back on that and say I, I would like to formally propose that and and, and suggest that that happens? Uh, thank you, Councillor Prentice, thank you. I've got two more to come in, um, Councillor Mellish, then Councillor Carellis, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just um, obviously accepting your, your direction about the presumption in favour of this proposal, but there are many around this chamber uh, who have serious disquiet uh, and opposition to this proposal. And I'm, and I'm wondering where, how we might actually show that, just, that, that opposition, uh, whether, how that can be registered. I assume you would wish us to vote in favour, um, or because at the moment I'm minded to vote against, uh, but um, that's not an option, it would seem. Um, so how would it, how do we register both within within the uh, the midst of this meeting that we are seriously concerned about the the proposal, uh, and how do we say that the decision has been taken out of our hands because of the KCC position? Just a second, I'm just collecting a couple of comments. Uh, is there anybody else who wants to make a comment before we move to a vote? Oh, sorry, Councillor Carellis, sorry, apologies. Yeah, I just want to back up what Councillor Mellish says. It feels very much because we're in presumption as if we can put conditions on this and yet we ultimately don't have a say. I would just also like to say, contrary to what Councillor Thomas said before, this is not purely because of Studmarsh, this is because of 13 years of Tory failure to build enough houses and especially the last administration to build enough houses. While we're talking about conditions, I would also like um, to address KCC to ask if they would turn Thanet Road into a 30 mile an hour rather than a 50 mile an hour limit. If we are having people walking along there and cycling along there, we cannot have cars speeding by at 50 because we all know they don't go at 50, they'll go at much faster. So I would like that to be put in too. Thank you. 
Not like a wheelchair. I think like you would like that better. Mm. That's a lobbying letter. We're just thinking that it's quite difficult to, well, for me to ask an officer to lobby, basically, which is what, what this probably is, vis-a-vis um, -vis whether we could ask for it to go in the same informative. We probably can't. No, no, but you... um, sorry, I'm giving consideration to it and just trying to work out how, how best we could say something. Um, I think what I want to say is that I did try and explain when I put the proposal. Oh, sorry, did you want to come in? I missed you. Councillor Franklin, I, I missed you, sorry. Yeah, no Please worries, thank in. you, Chair. Please come in before I sum up. <laughs> um, yeah, I think with this proposal, you know, I've, the houses and that I'm quite happy with, especially with how sustainable and they are, as well as with the uh, park and ride that's being proposed in this. However, I think with the effects on transportation and the fact it's being built on grade three agricultural land, I, you know, I find it so um, daunting, the fact that we are being imposed on this um, uh, by a national target because we're in presumption right now. And so I shall be uh, abstaining in protest of the fact that we are not happy with this site, but yet we're compelled to by uh, presumption. Councillor Stockley. Very briefly, I wonder if it would be helpful for this committee if um, we would have an explanation of what will happen, assuming that we refuse this application, what will the procedure be if, the, which is likely, the developer then goes to the government inspector? What will the council lose? What control will we lose? What, are the, what effects will that decision have on this development? Thank you. Well, if I could venture to say that at the moment, we don't really have planning reasons to refuse. And I've put the proposal to um, support the officer's recommendation. I would, um, I mean, the, the, the first thing that would happen would be that we couldn't put the conditions on. Um, we couldn't require an inspector to do what we would want to do. Um, and that obviously is a, a one thing that we are trying to nail a few things down. Um, and, um, you know, if uh, we were to lose the proposal um, to grant, um, somebody's got to come up with some pretty good reasons, otherwise we've got costs as well, which, you know, because we won't, you know, because we do need substantive reasons um, under the circumstances we're in. I mean, I, I am very happy to say that, you know, and get in the minutes, that we do regret the fact that we um, are in a, the situation we're in, in presumption. Um, and on the other hand, we are attempting to get, you know, the, the good quality um, uh, that we have been assured can come with this development into um, the conditions, um, in addition to the conditions that the officers already proposed. Um, I really think I need to move. <laughs> OK, one more, one more. Uh, we need to move to the vote. Um, Councillor Bothwell, I'll give you one more. You haven't said very much. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, several councillors have mentioned that this site is not sustainable, um, but I would ask the question, what site would be sustainable? Um, we have approved sites 20 times bigger than this for 20 times as many houses uh, and 20 times as many traffic movements and 20 times as much environmental impact elsewhere in the district. Um, they've already been approved. So this is a relatively small site. Uh, and if it's, these houses are not built there, they'll have to be built somewhere else. And where is a better place to build them? Everyone is going to object to housing in their locality. Um, I think it's very rare that anyone will ever be in favour of local development. Thank you. Thank you. Could I now put the um, proposal to the vote? Um, the proposal is to um, 
uh, Section 101 grant subject to safeguarding conditions and completion of the legal agreement. Uh, we've got two conditions, 20% biodiversity net gain and net zero ready homes and an informative um, about KCC um, speed limit on that road. And um, I will write to KCC on behalf of the committee about the speed limit, which I'm sure local councillors and um, uh, county and city councillors can um, pursue um, and probably is, you know, really important considering Toucan crossings are only, only one crossing and there's a big road. Um, so could I please take the vote? Lauren, are you ready to? But thank you. Thank you very much. That's carried, Chair, with eight votes. Thank you. Um, it's eight for, one against, three abstentions. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we'll now take a five-minute break. Just remember that the live stream will be running to allow members um, who came for this particular item to leave and a comfort break. Thank you.
Um, thank you, everybody. Could we um, reconvene um, to deal with the next application? Thank you. Um, just waiting for one person. Do you really want her to miss any of it? Hmm? Oh, good. Oh, good. Right, we can um, move on to um, the application number seven, um, which, uh, sorry, item number seven, which is application number... CA 22-02540, Maytree Paddock, Hawthorne Corner, pages 55 and 67 in your pack. Um, and could I please ask Planning Officer Kelly Tonkin to introduce the report. Thank you, Kelly. Um, good evening, Member. Good evening, Chair. This application is for a two-storey dwelling located at Maytree Paddock along Hawthorne Corner. This application site formed part of a larger site and has since been subdivided. Um, the application that we're considering tonight is for the northern section of the site. Um, to the south of the site was a previous planning application, which was granted plan permission at appeal. Oh, sorry. Uh, what should we do? What can we do? There's a screen here. This one's working. Uh, do you want to get up and move nearer a screen if you can't see it? Are you OK to move? Are we okay now? Everybody see something. Um, okay, um, Kelly, you can carry on, thanks. Great, so um, the application site's outlined in red, and as mentioned, it was previously formed a large part of the site. The application site that we're considering today is within the red outline, and it's located here. And I'll show you on the next page where that dwelling's located. Um, the southern section of the site was um, subject to a previous planning application, which was granted plan permission. Um, the application recommends a, um, is represents a departure from the local plan given its location outside of the urban boundary of Herne Bay. Um, the southern part of the site was subject to a planning ap appeal process in which is better considered that the site is not isolated. As you can see here, there's um, a cluster of dwellings located along Hawthorne Corner and as such it was considered acceptable location for that instance as well as being compliant with policy HD4 um, in which the sustainability credentials um, outweighed the harm. Um, here is the proposed block plan for the site, as you can here see here, which is where the new dwelling is to be located. Um, given the inspector found the application to be acceptable in principle, given it's um, not isolated dwelling, and alongside that the council is also in presumption of sustainable development and its proximity to the Hilbert development as well, the application is considered to be acceptable in principle in this instance. Um, here are the proposed elevations of the dwelling. Uh, this replicates the design and sustainability credentials of the dwelling that is also located to the south of the site. Uh, 
Um, here is a photo for context of the site. I'm stood um, and to the left of me is where the um, posed, previously approved dwelling is located and this is where the um, application site is to be located. And then this is me stood within the site um, looking across to where the previously approved dwelling is located and it's currently under construction at the moment. Um, as set out in the, in the officer's report, the application is recommended grant subject to safeguarding conditions and legal agreement. Thank you. So I just want to say, um, going back to where the elevations are, the, the sustainability credentials that I've mentioned is that it's Passy House Plus, so it, um, it essentially generates more energy than is it needs. Thank you. That was a helpful clarification. I think we'll all be happy about that. Um, thank you. Um, we've got two um, speakers for this item. Um, could I please ask Terry Thompson uh, to come up and speak? Oh, good evening. I was going to read, but I haven't got my glasses and I can't see it very well, so I'll do it off the cuff. No, it's all right. Um, I think most of it's been covered this evening in what you've been discussing with other things, but for me, this is a, a, a very good sustainable development, something I'd like to see on my desk, um, the passive house standard, and also the water issue, which you were discussing earlier, is dealt with on site, so sewage is treated on site. Um, so that's another thing worth looking at. And the fact that, as we said, we've uh, committed to a climate emergency. Um, there's good passage um, for biodiversity net gain, which I find is a bit of a strange comment because quite often, a bit like in the last application, they say I oh, was a biodiversity net gain, but we're not looking at proper corridors and sustaining that biodiversity. Whereas with this particular site, there's quite a lot of green space, the introduction of a ponded area, which James said he's going to do, which would be great, um, would also enhance it. Um, I don't think I need to say much more, apart from, it, it, to me, it's what I'd like to see. Um, it's wood um, rather than a brick, high density um, material. So therefore, um, hydrocarbons, all the elements that would be indicative of cement and brick build aren't there. Um, so yeah, lightweight construction, very well insulated. Uh, producing its own energy. Um, so that's what I'd like to say, really. I'll leave you with James. Thanks. Um, thank you. And the second speaker, James Woodward. Um, thank you. Thank you, councillors. Um, well, this is my site. I had the first one done, um, but it took so long to get planning over five years had to sell it so I could do what I wanted to do, was to build an off-grid home um, to see if it is workable. Uh, the whole point being is it could be completely off-grid or it could be part and part, but the idea was to have a fairly, somewhere nice to live with lovely views and for the hiking and cycling I like to do um, with peace and quiet, but it's somewhere which makes it more comfortable to be with. It's an infill site between two other properties and also it's on the back end of the Ulterior Park, which has got 1,300 houses being built. And their combined sort of is 130,000 tonnes of carbon just to build the homes and another 15,000 a year just to sustain the mine zero build and also zero uh, sustainability on it. Um, so the whole thing should be um, a plus point for everything. Both the houses will look basically the same because they're built the same plans um, and should be a nice place to live. Apart from that, I mean, it's very, very, very difficult to get self-build properties done. There aren't any I've seen at all in the Canterbury district on your ever plans you have. There aren't any at all. And this has had two, and we had a huge problem when we sold the first one to get it to be on the self-build plot. Apart from that, like I say, it's not a salubrious site. It's got sewage works one side, sanit way the other, but it does have nice views over the farmland into a cove in the sea until it gets built on in the future, I'm sure. But at the moment, that's what I'd like to do, is do something positive. That's me, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> um, so I'd like to propose um, uh, to support the officer's recommendation um, to section 101 grant subject to legal agreement and safeguarding conditions. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Carellis seconding. Thank you. 
Um, does anybody... Oh, sorry, I can turn myself off before I... Do. Anybody um, like to um, comment? Um, so I've got Councillor Stockley and then Councillor Bothwell. Thank you. I think, uh, you know, as we've heard from Kenny, that uh, this really is acceptable as far as the inspector is concerned. So we are in a position, and to be honest, you know, we're talking about a, a very sustainable property. Part of me thinks that we could probably get a, a few dozen uh, affordable homes on this plot, but uh, it's not our plot to build on. But uh, you know, it, it sounds like a brilliant idea, and personally, I'm for it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, no, I would uh, fully support this application. Um, it's uh, an exemplary standard, and it's the kind of standard that we should be building all new houses to. It's carbon neutral, passive house plus. It creates more energy than it uses. It has, has triple glazed windows and is highly sustainable. Thank you. Councillor Castle. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just really a point, really. Um, obviously, it's my first as a substitute for planning meeting. I think it's a shame a lot of the other residents left because it's a real chalk and cheese application and it would have been fantastic to see a, a developer in the district build more of these houses. It would be so easy and I think that's what's really been quite disappointing tonight. On, on a large scale site, you can't disapprove of a passive house. You know, if someone came along with 300 of these, even in my ward, I think there'd be quite a lot of residents that'd be hard pushed to disagree with it so i think that's what's really frustrating from environmental sustainable all the topics we covered on the previous application so i obviously fully support it but it really shows that because it's in herne bay we can just say yes and um, crack on and if it was anywhere else they could actually say yes as well so that would be nice to see maybe moving forward thank you um so if there's no other comments i'd like to put this to the vote and um, a vote for is a vote to Section 101 grant, subject to legal agreement and safeguarding conditions. Thank you. That's carried unanimously, Chair, with 13 votes. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so... Uh, planning appeals report, item 10. Um, so we just note, yep, so we uh, note by general assent. Thank you. If, I, if you could do that, thank you very much, everybody. Um, note that report. Um, we haven't got any urgent business to be dealt with in public, and it's we're not required to exclude the public for any items either. Um, so, and no other business which fall under exempt provisions. Um, so the date of the next meeting is Tuesday the 9th of January. And thank you very much, everybody, for your